Welcome to Taking Care of Business on News Talk 1180-KERN for the best in Saturday talk radio at 1 o'clock and on 1230-KGEO at 10 o'clock on Saturday. And for the very best in Wednesday talk radio on 1410-KERI and now on 1000-KKIM in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Your host is Clay Kerner and I'm Marty Pay. Hey, Clay, we've had some great guests in the next month coming up. We've got uh, Gary Bauer coming up from the family, or used to be from the Family Research uh, Council. And uh, Michael Reagan, Reagan's going to be here talking about an event that's going on in October. With uh, Shannon Grove, <coughs> I believe. Yes, yeah, definitely. But today we've got a very, very special show. In the second half, we have Steve Harding, author of a great new book that I uh, guarantee is going to be a new movie in the future, The Last Battle. But right now in studio, we have author, educator, adjunct professor, Ernie Zara, to talk about his new book, Teacher-Student Relationships. Ernie, welcome to Taking Care of Business. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Clay. It's great to be here with you this morning. Good to have you. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate so it. You guys have a little bit of a history there, don't yeah, you? Yeah, we go back. We went to church together for several years. Did you? Yeah, and then I got thrown out. Well, why does that not surprise me, Ernie? <laughs> Um, with Clay, everything's a surprise. That's all I <laughs> yeah. can say about that. Yeah. Actually, that's not true. I, uh, we had a great relationship at church. Ernie was a leader in the church, and I was just an attender. Good. That's Good. what some lady said. She said, all Clay ever does is go and sit in the pew. Well, you know, there's, there's an advantage to you sitting in the pew well, and that's not speaking. That's what I thought church was all about, going yeah. and listening. One time the pastor said to me, um, Clay, you ought to uh, listen to the, to the admissions a couple of times. I really, it's really good this this Sunday, and I said, Roger, I don't need that much sleep. <laughs> well, Ernie, this is a special occasion for us because Clay usually doesn't stay awake during the whole show. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here to be his alarm clock. How's that sound? <laughs> well, I, I wanted to set this up by reading a paragraph from your website that I thought was pretty appropriate. Thank you. Consider a male teacher who also coaches a team your son plays on. He begins making advances towards your 16-year-old. You notice something odd between the coach and your son and after one of his games, but you, you let it go. Two weeks later, you read in the local newspaper that your son's coach was arrested for allegedly molesting some of his players. You discover that your son and the coach were sexting each other on their cell phones during the evening hours. Now you must question your son. Does this really happen a lot? Is it a, something very serious, apparently? Yeah, Marty, Clay, this problem is a pandemic here nationally. Um, we only hear about it when the media gets hold of it, and usually when there's arrests that are made. But there are a lot of boundaries being crossed today in the classroom by educators, and it's not that they are choosing necessarily to do something inappropriate, but they're crossing boundaries for many reasons, and one of the reasons is that the training that they're getting today does not really apply in the classroom. They don't know where the lines are any longer. The teachers and don't? The teachers really don't. Veteran teachers have a, a little different understanding about a, a moral framework than the newer generation does. And that's exacerbated just a little because of technology as well. Because technology 24-7 today has made things very different. It's changed the game of communication and relationships in, in schools, whether public, Christian, private, or, uh, you know, whatever have you. All the way through college, in fact. So technology has, has opened the doors to new phenomena. And one of those you mentioned was the sexting. Where, uh, where teachers, uh, students, where students and students and other, other adults and children begin to flirt, begin to talk about uh, sexual things in ways that are loose-handed or, or open-ended in a jesting kind of way. And so what we have now is, is a flirtation that occurs through technology that's not face-to-face -face unless they choose that. And now we're finding out we're saying things and crossing lines because of the use of technology that we didn't do so, in the past. So, yeah, there is a problem nationally with the way we use tech. But at the same time, there's some problems in our views about a culture that have changed the moral landscape in the last 30 years. You know, before we started the show, Ernie, you and I were talking when I lived in Carpinteria that at the junior high school, the principal there used to always hold classes for the parents to identify um, teachers or others that would come on campus that would harass or sexually harass the kids. And as I explained to you, we found out later it was the principal who was doing the classes that was the one that was actually molesting the kids. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting situation. We do know now that the normal profile or the average profile for a person who has these particular problems with children is normal looking. 
is a person who doesn't necessarily stand out. So there's really no one profile, Clay, that we can look to and say, ah, uh, here is a pedophile, or here is a molester, or here is someone who has the propensity toward that. But there are markers, and there are things we can do to make sure that we guard against even the notion of thinking that these are appropriate relationships. And in my book, I talk a lot about those safeguards and a lot about interview process and many things that you can do so that we don't have to hear about this problem after arrests are made or, or sex registration, you know, sex offender registration occurs, so that we can deal with it and save a lot of lives on the front end, not just say, wow, reactively on the back end that, hey, look what happened. This is really bad. Let's deal with it on the front end. In that situation uh, where you have people who are in working with children every day, who have access to the children in hours, after hours, during school, after school, it's not uncommon to have those kinds of folks we're finding after the fact work within the network where they bring the children to them rather than have to go to the children to cause such harm. We're having a conversation with uh, author, educator, Ernie Zara, talking about his new book, Teacher-Student Relationships. You know, your, your new book, Teacher-Student Relationship, is that designed for teachers, for students, for parents? Who's it designed for, or who should be reading this book? The book targets all the audiences. The teacher and student relationships is the catchphrase, because uh, there's a lot of arrests that were occurring. And, you know, three years ago... Um, I really got fed up looking at the newspaper, reading headlines about my colleagues who've been arrested again for long-term relationships sexually, emotionally, physically with students. And I said, somebody's got to do something about this. So two years go by, I'm doing some research, and on a coffee table in my study, I have a map of the United States. And on this map, I use little dot markers, little adhesive markers, and I put those down all over the nation. It's where there's been an arrest an actual arrest and a conviction of teachers. My son came home from uh, college one day and said, Dad, uh, are these the places you've spoken in the past? And I said, I wish. Yeah. But it really turned out that I told him this is where teachers have been arrested for inappropriate or sexual relationships with students, and he was stunned by that. And you see, I was stunned by that too. So I wrote it because of teachers and students, but I also have chapters in the book for parents, for um, coaches, administrators, for um, board members, for all of us to get engaged in the dialogue, not just to point out the problems, but to deal with solutions and how do we shore up this business between what we used to know as lines between authorities in the classroom and the school settings and the community, where they've now blurred so badly that the cover of my book implies that we're not sure if she on the cover is a student or a teacher. Right. And that's mm -hmm. the blurring that's occurred. So, yeah, there's, this book's written for a whole vast array of audiences. You know, uh, usually when they arrest a, a teacher, as an example, for sexual perversion with a student, the man teachers or men teachers end up going to jail, but the women teachers end up getting probation. Why is that? Well, not so much anymore. There, there are a lot more women being arrested today than men being arrested today. And so we have uh, probably a two-to-one ratio right now of women who have been in long-term relationships with students. In fact, just last year, the teacher of the year in the state of New Jersey was arrested. The teacher of the year Oof. was arrested, charged, and convicted. Was it an all-boys school? No, it wasn't an all-boys oh, school. I was just kidding. But <laughs> I, know you, I know you were, but those things happen at all-boys and all-girls schools as well. But the point about this teacher of the year is, here's a trusted individual, awarded all this, had the fare, decided to cut it off over the summer, and just last summer was arrested for it because the student didn't want it to end. And normally where it goes is that there are other students who say, hey, uh, you and this teacher are, you know, getting it on here. Let's, can we have fun too? And so if she turns them down, then they're outed and things happen. But the question that I have that's overarching for the entire book is why would a 38, 42, 25, 50-year-old who has everything that they've worked for in their profession and financially and security and family and education and reputation and community and church, why would they throw it all away to have a relationship with a 16 and a half year old with braces and pimples? What has happened for that shift in culture to say that that risk is worth taking to throw it all away? And I think that's a great question for us to start off the second half with, and we'll be back in a moment on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk 1180.